Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us. If you are a first-time listener, welcome to the conversation, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, with our first-time listeners, we always want to ask a couple things. Number one, don't, fit, don't forget to hit the subscribe so you uh, can get the latest episodes. Number two, don't forget to go to the rexandrewshow.com uh, website so you can get the information on all of our guests. And then three, I'm not bashful. I will beg. In fact, I've got a caller on today, so I will say I'm a well-dressed beggar. So if you like what we're doing, uh, please hit us up with those stars in the uh, app distribution stores so that way we can get better placement. All right. We want to thank those who are turn tuning back into the show. We have listeners all over the world, 32 countries, across uh, more than 500 cities, six continents. But what we like to do is recognize listeners in different places. So today, I'd like to recognize our listeners in Concord, North Carolina. So welcome to the program. All right. As other people know, our show is about biographies and people's stories, awesome people doing great things. Got another one of those today for you. I'm excited to get him on the air here because uh, I got a lot of interest in the topic he's done. And he's done something very interesting. Not that many people know about them yet because it's an up and coming uh, niche in the marketplace as far as shows and podcast distribution and how things are marketed, et cetera. So uh, he's the uh, CEO of a podcast network and uh, been cranking it and gone from nothing to over 30 podcasts and uh, he's an entrepreneur i uh, you know i'm not going to call the guy a serial entrepreneur because he's not that old i mean he's not in my uh, genre so uh but he's an entrepreneur and guy that really puts it together so i'd like to welcome to the show this morning andy pedic andy how are you i'm doing excellent rex thanks so much for having me on glad to have you now i understand you're dialing in today from denver I am. Uh, fantastic. It's always great to have somebody right here in the neighborhood. So Andy, you know, you've probably listened to an episode or two as we talked af offline on prep. And, um, you know, we like to talk about people's stories. Success doesn't fall out of the sky. You know, here in Denver, oh, a few months ago, we had some airplane parts fall out of the sky. Some of them landed about three blocks from my house. So, uh, but success doesn't fall out of the sky like that. So we want to talk about your journey and the influences to where you got uh, to today and what you're up to. But uh, first, we want to go back in time. So don't worry about writing these down. I will fire these questions off to you. But I, we want to know some things that have influenced you. So number one, um, where did you grow up? And then, oh, excuse me, where were you born? Those are quite different sometimes. I had a guest on our show, Ellie Soja, who actually moved 63 times before the age of 15. She was the daughter of an international con man and spent time in and out of refugee camps. Compelling story. I doubt you moved 63 times, but we'd like to know uh, where you were raised. We want to know about your family, okay? So do you have siblings, okay? And if you do have siblings, did any of them survive your harassment? Uh, we want to know about your parents, okay? So what did your parents do while you were growing up? That's very influential, uh, both from a professional level, what they did, but also the family environment. Now, after interviewing hundreds of people in my radio and podcasting career, I've kind of found there are three buckets of uh, parent types. The first one is what I call the super launch pad, but parents, totally engaged, helping you along, pushing you in fact. So they did a lot of work to get you going. The second one is what I kind of call the non-participatory parents. Now, certainly they love their kids, however, they were so busy eking out a living that they weren't as available as uh, kids might want. And then the last one I always talk about is the struggle bucket. And this is where there might be things like addiction, abuse, extreme poverty, dysfunction. And what it does is motivate people who are successful to turn that into something and say, hey, I don't want to be anything like that. So that's important to understand. Then we want to know what you did with your spare time as a kid. What interests did you have? Were you into sports, uh, dance, theater, computers, shoplifting? And yes, I had a guest on the show by the age of 15 who was a car thief. And that was, an, accomplish that was an accomplishment for him. So we want to know about how you spend your spare time. Then we'll hop around your education and then some pivot points in your life. So what things influenced you? And then 
We want to know what you're up to today because you're doing something that's very interesting, especially in my mind. But podcasting is such a huge thing these days. So it's important um, for us to understand what's going on and what you're up to. So Andy, if you could, where were you born? I was born and raised in the same place in the inland Northwest, the United States in a city called Spokane, okay. most notably known as the birthplace of Bing Crosby and the home to a Jesuit university called Gonzaga that is known for their basketball team. They went to yes. the national championship this year. Yeah. So although I'm not a bulldog, uh, it's kind of <clears throat> bled into society and in the inland Northwest and <laughs> Spokane is a medium-sized city. I say it's a small, big city, not a big, small city. Yeah. It's the second largest city in Washington after Seattle. It's larger sure. than Tacoma and Olympia. But it's on the eastern side of the Cascade Mountains and right up against North Idaho and Western yeah. Montana. And kind of in that vein, it's not the most diverse place. This makes it sound like I grew up in Hickville, but... <laughs> Spokane is 92% Caucasian yeah, and not a lot of variety of uh, thinking. Well, thinking and also just culture. You don't have a very huge, you know, uh, diverse, you know, restaurants and, and different cultures and things there. So, uh, however, one of the strengths of an area like that is you know, it's a farming and ran uh, ranching and, and fruit growing areas and stuff. And so um, there's some interesting dynamics there that you can't find in a lot of places. So, yeah, I would agree with you. Eastern Fantastic. Washington is huge for, as you mentioned, agriculture and big wine country. Yeah. Washington is the second largest wine producing region in Northern California. And there's uh, over a thousand wineries in Washington. A lot of people don't know that. Well, I didn't but know that. With the lack of industry, as you mentioned in Spokane, most of it is service industry. So it's not that it's uh, not it, it's not welcoming to people, but people don't move there because a lot of the jobs are in the service industry versus I think there's a big hydropower company and there's one or two tech businesses, but there yeah. isn't exactly a booming uh, employment opportunities. So would you say it's kind of an unknown gem? Uh, I don't necessarily love Spokane all that much. <laughs> a lot of people actually have been flocking to the area in the past 10 years with it being cool for celebrities to move to places like Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. A lot of people bought homes on Lake Coeur d'Alene in yeah. the Idaho panhandle, just yeah. about 30 minutes uh, east of Spokane. So Coeur d'Alene is very well known. One of the good things about the area is there are, 50 golf courses that wow. are world-class that you can pay, you can play for 30 or 40 bucks, you know? Okay. And I moved to Seattle and you're packed with three foursomes on every hole and you have to have a card and you're spending a couple hundred bucks and yeah, Bocan has a low cost of living. And when I was growing up, every one of my friends had a lake cabin and a ski condo and was members of a golf course. And that makes it sound pretentious, but it's cheap. You can have yeah. a, big home and do a lot of things and have toys because the cost of living is significantly lower than other places other in the places. West coast. Oh, that's fantastic. So how about your family? Do you have siblings? I have one. He's younger, younger. Okay. He's a uh, high achiever. He's a cardiologist. He's finishing his sports cardiology fellowship at Massachusetts general hospital. Oh, fantastic. And he's a, uh, he's a prodigy. Okay, cool. Now, how many years between you? Yeah, four. Four. Okay. That's a good spread. So going through school, you can have your own identity. It's not big brother tag along or little brother tag along as much. Right. I was a freshman in college when he was a freshman in high school. Yeah. And then he went to college at university of Washington in Seattle after I moved to Seattle after school. So I was around for his college career as well. So yeah, we were close enough to have a lot of the same friends, but far enough to have done school differently. Yeah. And we have, a very similar personality, but we're exact opposites. He's extremely type A, extremely calculated, valedictorian all the way through. Right. And he's good at math and science. I was more into music and writing and uh, art. Creative stuff. <laughs> yeah. Very, so very right brain. Tell us a little bit about your parents. Um, growing up, my folks both uh, worked in the advertising industry. Okay. My dad is a professor of uh, communications advertising at Washington State University. 
Okay. And uh, they owned an agency together. My mom is a graphic designer. They both do copywriting. So I was very fortunate as a kid to get drug around to photo shoots and oh, cool. design studios. And I started using Photoshop before it was called Photoshop. <laughs> so I was very, very lucky as a kid to be around all of that kind of stuff. So my dream was always to be the madman kind of guy, especially that show came around when I was in, in college or well, maybe after college, but it really resonated with me because uh, that's a period, you know, before my parents' career even, but just the idea of big ad agencies and really cool uh, companies you get to represent. My dad took me to Portland a lot for a photographer that he works with that okay. works with Nike and Adidas and fancy jewelry companies. So I got to see a lot of cool stuff and he's been teaching for 37 years at the same university and a couple mm -hmm. others. So my dad has uh, alumni that are all over the country. And so I had a ton of mentors nice. and a lot of people that, wanted to help us out. And he always had students that were broke that would come up to Spokane for the summer and intern for him and be my golf coach or something. He's just a very altruistic guy and thrives on helping young people. He uh, runs a nonprofit that does kids athletic events. He started a running company uh, sponsored by Nike at the time. And they put on the world's largest kids running event with 10,000 runners <laughs> Wow. And uh, it since expanded to being associated with the military. So they do on Armed Forces Day in April, they do simultaneous runs at 164 military installations around the world. And they send out T-shirts and training packets. And there's programs for underprivileged families to get a free pair of shoes. There's a lot of things that cross over with education. So he's done a lot with that. My mom uh, was a, a designer and a creative director. And she was the one that, although they were both at every single sporting event, she was on the parent teacher group okay. and she was involved in our schooling and she went back to school or she went back to school. She went back to work, uh, when my brother went to high school and she was the medic or she was the communications director for a big, uh, hospital network. She worked at a children's hospital and she worked with hospitals in six states. So she's also very involved with children and health. And she's uh, spent her career specializing in uh, medical marketing and, and kind of social stuff. Okay, cool. So it sounds like and looking, my observation would be you had a huge impact for marketing, communications, connecting with people. I mean, that would kind of the culture at your home. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I had every opportunity. My parents were definitely very far in group one of okay, your great. three. And they took us all over the world and we had a lot of opportunities. We weren't extremely wealthy, but we were an upper middle class white family in Eastern Washington where there wasn't a lot of uh, adversity. <laughs> so if anything, I, I would have... Uh, I would have no complaints about my childhood. If anything, maybe they were a little bit snow plowy. I think they pushed <laughs> a lot of things out of our way okay. so we could have the path of least resistance. But both of us, my brother and I were able to do a lot of things. And one of the things I appreciated about my upbringing is my parents enabled us to try anything that we wanted to do. Okay. So I was going from horseback riding lessons to hockey practice, to trumpet lessons, to art school. And I went to summer camp to do specialty art stuff. And then it was, oh, do you want to go to church camp or are you into that? If you're not, it's okay. Do you want to spend the summer trying to get a job at the mountain skiing and teaching kids or whatever mm -hmm. you want to do? And uh, we were very fortunate that our parents helped us pay for college, but my brother and I both had jobs in high school and in college. And we learned a lot about money and how to support ourselves and take care of things. And so it was, uh, it's going to come as no surprise. I, my first job actually was at a winery for a family friend that, that owned a really cool outfit up there. But I, all the way through high school and college coached kids athletic camps Okay. And I did uh, football and hockey and soccer and I did kids night things and I coached little 
U five soccer leagues with five year olds. Fantastic. So for uh, five or six years, I did a lot of sports stuff and that carried on into college. I was a campus rep for sports illustrated and I volunteered with kids. And so kids in sports were a big thing growing up. And then in the post graduate uh, life, it was still a lot of kids, but also alcohol, which those seem like they don't necessarily <laughs> mend together, but wine meant a lot to me. And I uh, ended up going to the same school that my dad teaches at. And okay. weirdly enough, I took the major that he is the director of. Okay. So a lot of kids had their parent, you know, you had a friend in high school whose parent was a teacher there. Yeah, and nice. it would be Mrs. Walther, was it for me? My buddy, Neil, his mom was a, uh, was a history teacher. And she would be the one at the dances with the fly swatter pushing people apart, right? Nice. But when it's college, it's entirely different. And I was a couple classes ahead. I was taking pretty advanced classes from freshman, sophomore year. And as I mentioned, I, I had a job at the newspaper and I was a radio DJ and I worked with the snowboarding team and I did sports illustrated and I was a rep for Brooks running shoes. So wow, I had okay. all of these, I did a couple internships. I had all of these things that I was able to do and uh, they enabled me to be able to venture out and save my own money and do things. So I did a radio internship in Seattle. I worked at a bike shop and I just had a ton of really great experiences. And when we were, I was probably in fourth grade. So maybe I was 10 or 11 and my brother was like six. My folks took us to Disney world in Florida. Okay. And as many people have found out, I'm sure you have to, it's crack price. Yeah. <laughs> and you can pretty much travel anywhere on the planet for the cost of going to a Disney property. Oh yeah. So as absolutely. enchanting and great as it is for kids, my parents were like, well, this is silly. We'd like our kids to have more experience. So every summer for 18 years, uh, we went somewhere abroad and we switched off which of the four of us got to choose. Yeah. And eventually I got married and there was five of us and we, I've been to 45 countries, I think. Fantastic. And we got to go all over the place and we saw culture and we took in language and some of the places you can't go to anymore. Yeah. And I've been to parts of Russia and I've been to places where it former Yugoslavia and haven't done a ton of Africa, but we, we were very fortunate and our parents, as I mentioned, it sounds like I've listed off the perfect childhood, but my folks weren't extremely wealthy, but they gave everything to my brother and I. That's, and, fan that's fantastic. Um, yeah. I'll have to agree with you on the whole Disney thing. The thing I've, uh, you know, cause I've been to both parks and you want you pay so much money to stand in line for hours <laughs> and maybe ride 10 rides if you're lucky there if you've spent the entire day there so uh you better get the four day pass that's right that's, that's only right two thousand bucks <laughs> yeah it's, it's crazy well that's incredible you've had a very um diverse uh background i mean you know as far as the things you've done and the influences and, and the experiences you know there's nothing in the world more important than experiences i think ex as when I was a hiring manager and back in my tech days when I worked in corporate and experience just made so much more um, value to me than anybody's resume. So I want to ask you another question. Looking back in your, your growing up in your early formative years and even through college, setting aside your parents, okay, was there someone who you remember that was just this, I don't want to say iconic, but someone that was really um, that impacted your life outside of your parents? Yes. I was one of those people. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. My parents were entrepreneurs. And for better or worse, when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. my grandpa told me two things. One was Andy, an honest man always wears a belt. Okay. Not sure. <laughs> but he had a lot of those isms. And yeah, uh, I always wear a belt. But the other one was you don't want to be good at everything, great at nothing. And that has been a plague for me my entire career. And we can talk about that later. But the, the lessons that I learned was, especially in high school, I 
I was in band, but I didn't practice enough because I played sports and I was in sports, but I showed up late and I was bumbling around with my trumpet and my music. And I was a total dork and I did language and I did art and I was in boy Scouts and I did a lot of things. And later on, I ended up facing some kind of mental health stresses, Mm -hmm. but because all of those things happened, there was, uh, a lot of people, I didn't have a super deep connection with my sports coaches or any particular teachers, but Mm -hmm. I had a trumpet instructor and I took private trumpet lessons for about 10 years. And he was a prolific musician, like being the principal in the Spokane orchestra, isn't that cool, but he could have played anywhere. And it was really neat. And just spending a half an hour every Wednesday afternoon from fourth grade until college with this guy who taught me music was pretty great. And I always felt like I didn't deserve it because I didn't practice enough and I didn't progress the way his other students did because he was very much the best of the best. And all of our rivals from the other high schools and everything in music, we had a pretty like cutthroat music scene. And when I was in high school, we, we won the Washington all state and we got to represent our state in the festival of the States in Washington, DC. So it was this like bloodbath of music dorks, but (laughs) I had the best teacher and everybody knew that I had the best teacher. And the fact that I wasn't always the best player because I was doing so many activities, uh, stuck with me, but he understood who I was and he, he really inspired me a lot. And I think that that was, although he constantly was coming down on me and giving me kind of that tough love accountability that I wasn't getting everywhere else because I did have an extremely nurturing family and a lot of people around us that, um, they weren't the, like, everybody gets a ribbon type, yeah, but they were definitely like high five, accept yourself for who you are. You did great. Maybe that's not for you, whatever. Right. You may hate football, but you're great at soccer or right. there's always another thing. So he kind of gave me that you're here. You've committed to this. Get your shit together. Okay. And when you're 10, that's, that's big. That's big. Okay. So how, how are you as a student? Were you a good student? Were you all over the map? Uh, what did your grades look like? And this is just a goofy question after listening to all the things you're interested in. Uh, my grades were not great. Okay. I have the uh, intellect. I did well at the things that I meant to do well at, mm-hmm. but I found out much later in my adult life that um, I had some pretty serious uh, anxiety and depression issues. Okay. And it's hard to bring up. I've gone to a shitload of therapy and we'll sure. talk about this a little later, but, uh, from the age of 23 to 33, at one point I was writing a book called everything you don't want to happen to you before you turn 30, because <laughs> short of chronic illness or, uh, extreme poverty disadvantage. I mean, there's a lot of other things, right. But I, I call it first world white guy problems. Like I'm very aware of the opportunities that I have, but I was divorced twice before the age of 33. I had to file bankruptcy. I've gotten sued by multiple of my business partners. I've lost businesses. I've had health issues. My folks got divorced after 35 years and being a child of divorce when you're an adult, uh, you know, you don't know how to, how to associate that. Right. And at some point your parents stopped, being parents and they become your friends or whatever relationship they are to you. But it was hard. My, my parents got divorced the same year that I did. And I was going through a lot of stuff. So after um, a, a litany of uh, therapy, I found out that in high school, I was really girl crazy and I was really performance stressed. And I never felt the pressure of most of our family friends, their kids were all, valedictorians. They went to Ivy league schools and my brother was right there cut from the same cloth. And I was kind of the, the black sheep. And so everybody thought it was cool because Andy was into art and I did good at the stuff that I cared about, but I don't think that I'm dumb and I'm bad at math and science, but I barely passed because of whatever it was. I really struggled to focus. I really struggled to do homework. I had a lot of social anxiety and 
I kind of compartmentalized that stuff in my adult life because I didn't want to think about it. But I just always wanted the next thing. When I was in high school, I really wanted to be in college. Okay. And my senior year, I was dating a girl who was in college. And I would leave and drive down to see her and spend time with her friends. And um, I didn't put a ton of focus on school. So I sort of skated by a few things in, uh, in college acceptance, uh, GPA bypassing, and in getting a job college GPA bypassing, but the, the standardized tests and the standardized metrics were never really a great fit for me. Okay. So would you categorize yourself? I'm just listening, you know, I'm an observer. That's kind of the, and then a storyteller. Uh, would you categorize yourself as just like a really quick learner? Um, cause when listening to you, we, we parallel a lot. You know, I was president of the class and I was a football player, but I was into everything. I was in, you know, there aren't a whole lot of football players that are in speech and debate and just, you know, all right. these things. And I dabbled in music and just all these types of stuff, but I got bored of things quickly and I would get through, I would try things. I would just kind of see the end and I'm like, okay, I got that On to the next thing, right? Kind of thing. And that's followed me throughout my life. And so um, it sounds like we're sort of similar. And I've, I just wonder, are you a person who kind of observes, hey, I, you know, I get, I get this, now I'm on to the next? Or are you, just, are you a quick learner? Yeah, I think the, it's hard to not look like, at that age, I think I did so many things so I could always be disappearing from one. I had the oh, ripcord, okay. you know? Okay. So you're and pulling the ripcord all the time. It's hard for me. Right. And even now it's hard for me to talk about having social anxiety in high school, because if I say that to either my parents, for some reason, the way that they are, they think that that's me saying they did a bad job. Right. And that's not true at all. But I was great at soccer, but I had too many nerves to do tryouts. I was great at music, but I couldn't play solos. And I had track meets where I would, get sick in the locker room and knock it on the bus oh or goodness. I would have to, you know, I trained for six months in hurdles, but then I would have to fake an injury because I was so freaked out. Oh. And I had a lot of stuff that um, my friend group was mild. You know, we were kind mm -hmm. of cool, but friends with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I would always have to bow out because I wasn't a huge partier. I, I could hang, but I would always have a reason to escape. Tomorrow I'm leaving to go on a ski trip or something. Okay. And so, yes, when we get to the mid twenties, I always look like the grass is greener guy. And yeah. part of that was a defense mechanism because if you, for any reason, fail by your definition, you can say, oh, I was doing too many things at once or the next thing's more important or I'm resilient and I can bounce back. And I developed a... Uh, I developed kind of a self-defeating, I guess I'd had that back to the beginning too. I developed kind of a self-defeating measure where as long as I'm being altruistic, I work with a lot of nonprofits. I'm on the board of a couple of companies. I help kids. I donate a lot of the money that I make right. or I give it back to my employees. So as long as I'm giving everything, it's okay if I'm not making what I used to at my corporate job. Okay. Or when I left, when I liberated from my big corporate job to become an entrepreneur, I started a brewery and it was always like, oh, Amazon's still calling, trying to recruit me. Uh, and I could always go back. I could always get X price tag. Sometimes right. I would even go through the interview process to see how much they'd offer me, but I had no intention of going. I just needed to know because people browbeat into you that how much money you make is important and yeah. that's silly. So from there forward, as long as I was reinvesting everything I made or cultivating people or coaching and mentoring, that made it okay for me to be what I projected as failing to myself or my family or whatever else, because I wasn't making as much money. Okay. And that's something that financial things hit me later on because I jumped on a grenade for a few people and I <laughs> had a bit of a financial breakdown. Yeah. So- uh, the question I, that comes to my mind, because uh, I've had to deal with, you know, mental health is, it hits a lot of people. It's about 20% of the population, you know, at least depression or, or even uh, deeper than that. So when did you get help? And then when and how, look, tell us a little bit about that. Was there a self-awareness? Was there someone else that said, hey, hey, Andy, 
you need to go get some help from these things, from the anxiety and the depression, because obviously if you didn't manage that, there would be, it would be hard to have six long-term success because you continue to run. You'd be the ripcord man uh, right. based on that. So did you get help and how old were you or what was the pivot point there? Well, in order to set the stage for that, let me fast forward through the twenties in the simple way. Okay. So I was recruited out of school by uh, the world's biggest wine company, E&J Gallo, okay. into a really specialized management development program. Mm -hmm. And they kind of browbeated into us that we started this process with 10,000 students on the West Coast and we hired six. Wow. And you better prove why we chose you. But it was like 15 rounds of interviews going back and forth to different cities. It was a very, very strenuous process. And mm -hmm. the... The training is second to none. It really is special. So I went to Seattle and worked for four or five years selling booze. I worked for a big beverage wholesaler. And on the side, I always had that entrepreneurial bug. I started and owned a cycling team for several years. Wow. And later I started a bike manufacturing company because there was a market opening. Um, one of the companies that made bikes that our team rode stopped manufacturing this specialized kind of cyclocross bike. And so I worked with some companies in Europe and Asia and actually started manufacturing bikes for my team myself. And I built a brand. Wow. So along the way, I was freelancing, doing some wedding photography and doing some graphic design. And I always had this thing where I wanted to do, I wanted to be the ad guy, you know, mm -hmm. and then I went into sales, which seems like a bit of a sacrilege, but right. uh, I, when I'm comfortable in a situation, I'm definitely, um, the go getty seeming type. And right. so if you see me on stage or you see me on a podcast or in front of a group of people, none of them would ever realize how introverted I am or that I have social anxiety. But they say that people with anxiety or introverts, they recharge in a different way. You know, they, they get gassed in that situation and they recharge on their own versus right. the opposite. Those people charge up when they're with people and then they, they feel gassed when they have to be at home. Yeah. So I was in a situation where it, I was in a sales uh, role. And if I wasn't out and about by five 30 in the morning, I felt like I was failing. Okay. And, but that hustle and bustle of seeing dozens of people and selling and selling and selling. And I sold 83,000 cases of booze in the three years that I was a salesperson. Oh my goodness. And that's like rockstar energy drink and bottled water and all this stuff. But it was one of those things where the, the instant gratification of closing a sale was always there. Yeah. So then you go to being self-employed and you're not getting a pat on the back every day. No. There's nobody else. I mean, frankly, sometimes it's just you. Yeah. So in the 2012, 13 era, the hard cider boom came around angry mm -hmm. orchard from Boston beer company kind of launched this new category and Washington and Oregon grow 75% of the country's apples. Yeah. So cider became very big in the Northwest. And so a good friend of mine and I started homebrewing cider and it was the great story. He grew up with grandparents that had a Gravenstein crab apple tree in their front yard and they made pies. And it was just this whole thing. My dad works in ag trade. So we started making cider and we ended up doing the two dudes in a garage thing. <laughs> but I, he had been working for a little while doing this and I quit my big job to do it. And unfortunately, about a year in, um, his wife got pregnant and said, really, no more startup time. Yeah. yeah. And so he went back and got a corporate job. But what had happened was, if you've ever owned a business, listeners, uh, Having partners is hard and you can gather where this is going, the going into business with friends thing or going into business with family or when you have a business partner, what their spouse thinks <laughs> comes into play. Right. And so I had this person who I really cared about a lot, but he wasn't contributing any labor. He wasn't giving up any stock and he wasn't putting in any money. And this person owned half my business and was just sitting on it. Wow. So since my friend that I started the business with was best friends with my ex-wife, like she's named after his mom oh, wow. and their four parents were all high school sweethearts and best friends. And they're practically siblings. Uh, I couldn't do anything about it. So I ran this business for three years by myself and I couldn't hire people. I couldn't raise money. I really couldn't get a loan. I couldn't do anything because half of my business was being sat on 
and I just didn't have margin. So I ended up getting super scrappy, moving out of our place, having somebody else manufacture our product. And I got us into over 2000 accounts in multiple states. And we were the only craft cider that was going into Safeway and the Kroger banner out there and huge accomplishments. But along the way, I felt nothing because I was under so much pressure to not come home and talk about how my day was because I'm going to bitch about this person that she cares about deeply. Oh my goodness. And wild dynamic. So I started a consulting business and I started a small marketing agency and I was doing that on the side in order to be able to subsidize working at my business. Mm -hmm. I did sales for three or four other companies and I designed wine labels and I uh, became an associate publisher at a beverage magazine and did sales for them. So I was working my butt off so the I could have two 40-hour-a-week jobs. One of them I got hopefully paid from, the other one I didn't. <laughs> but I, I subsidized this with working my, my just tail off. Right. And so I started getting really worn down. And then this horrible series of events happened. So through that's the mid-late 20s, I got to a point where I needed to get out of this business. And sure. so I had a company in California that was going to buy us and my then business partners, I had brought on another guy that I went to high school with that also went up in flames. Uh, they decided they weren't getting enough money out of it. Neither of them had done shit in three years, oh My goodness. but, and they were each going to get quite a bit and um, they decided they weren't getting enough. And that company wanted me to go and work for them. And it was like, I would have to sign a contract to go into indentured servitude for five years so they could collect royalties throughout that entire time based on my performance. Oh my goodness. And, but I was willing to do it because I wanted to save my marriage. Right. And so that one fell through. And then I had a company in Oregon that wanted to buy us. Same thing. I literally had already gone to work for them. I was collecting a salary and my name was signed. Lawyer's name was signed. They didn't sign. So I couldn't Mm. do it. And you can gather where this is going. It took yeah. about a year and a half. And I racked up so much debt on credit cards because I knew the deal was done. Yeah. I negotiated this thing and I had a job. I had some security at least. And I was going to, you know, it was silly because I was making several hundred thousand dollars for this company and I was not even going to get half of that. <laughs> and then I was going to get paid a $35,000 salary doing a $150,000 job. Wow. So, I was just fully ready, but even with how much it should have been, my payout over the five years should have been upwards of eight or 900,000 equivalent sure. out of the equity, the royalties, the salaries that I would have been getting. Mm-hmm. And I ended up getting zero. Wow. So three different companies tried to buy us and it was blocked by my partners for various reasons. And they got mad at each other. I was trying to play damage control. But at this point, I was missing the 800th sorority sister's wedding in Cleveland because I was out every night doing work and every weekend, and I adore my ex-wife. But we found a lot of things when we weren't working in the same industry anymore, and we weren't traveling every weekend. And I started being a lot more reclusive. Right. And because I was just so burned out about being out selling all day, every day. And she was extremely extroverted, cheerleader, yeah, just the ultimate salesperson. And we just never really figured out our um, language exchange, even though we were together for a long time. So this string of events happened. Uh, my folks, I bought out my business partners. I agreed that I'll pay you guys the royalty. I'll run this business. And I got on the hook for a lot of money. <clears throat> and... Yeah. Unfortunately, one of my partners, it was very smart on his part, but he insisted that I sign a personal guarantee. Mm. So everybody out there, if you own a business, you probably have it incorporated as an Mm. LLC or a corporation. But what that does is it makes it so if your business ever defaults or if someone sues you, you can close the business, but it doesn't breach into your personal um, assets. So I signed a personal guarantee that said if the business ever defaulted, that I would personally be liable for the money to them. But I had no reason to think otherwise. I'd been doing it for five years and I was running multiple businesses and I had a lot of clients and things were going okay. And I had a lot of people that counted on me. So 
And meanwhile, my other business had a full-time employee. We had a couple interns, like things were going pretty well. And the, I was working inside of multiple companies as their marketing director, as a consultant. So things seemed to be going okay. But um, it all kind of came to a head one day. I was actually at my doctor's office having a regular checkup. And all of a sudden, like many people have heard, uh, my eyes went blurry. The room closed in on me. My, my blood pressure spiked up and down 50 points like six times. And I had a really, really massive panic attack. And the first one is always the worst. You think sure. you're dying. Yeah. And I got to have an ambulance ride to the hospital and they locked me in a room by myself. And I had the most terrifying two hours of my life. And I always thought they could like sedate you or something, but I was having such, such intense. I, I mean, I mean, I was shaking. I looked like I was having a seizure. Mm -hmm. And so I'm laying on this stretcher in a, in an ambulance and I'm shaking so bad that I'm worried I'm going to like hit somebody. Right. And I never knew at the time that they just pop you two out of vans and wait 20 minutes and that's it. So I had this terrible experience in the hospital. I wasn't able to call anyone and I was completely alone. And at that point, it was just the worst string of events. I didn't work for three months. I was locked in my basement by myself. I missed client meetings. I lost clients. Nobody understood where I was and I wasn't able to run my business or make these royalty payments. Right. So I am not going to say that they're related, but uh, everybody can kind of connect the dots. Like I ended up getting divorced and uh, I got sued twice that year. And what happened was my Partners sued me for the assets in the business because my only way out was filing personal bankruptcy, but they wanted to maintain the intellectual property and the recipes and, the business, and everything. Yeah. So they sued my bankruptcy uh, processing, but the bankruptcy trustee wanted to reopen my divorce because I hadn't taken any money from my ex-wife. And since I hadn't paid myself in a couple of years, they wanted to try to plow through her for alimony. And I promised her that this wouldn't affect her. All right. So I was still protecting her after the fact. I was still protecting my business partners after the fact while they were suing me. And I was going through these massive debilitating panic attacks where I just couldn't do anything but stay at home. And I couldn't go further than a mile from my house without getting the shakes or having to have an emergency bathroom break or something. So all of a sudden, I just couldn't do anything. Wow, And I wasn't huge into social media. I wasn't making money online. Everything I was doing was based on me being out, pounding pavement, closing deals for people. Yeah, And so I lost all of my money, my business, my marriage, uh, my family, even going home to Spokane. My parents sold our childhood home and our cabin in Idaho. And you have those comforting places that you can always retreat right. to, even as an adult. Yeah, safe places. And yep. And my ex-wife's family in Boise, I used to go down there all the time. So all of a sudden, I, I had literally a leased car, and that was it. Mm. And I felt like such a huge failure because I jumped in front of a bullet for 45 people, and 39 of them fucked me. Uh, Excuse me. <laughs> but, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I've been a... Uh, so I became a huge martyr. And in my world, I just had this pity party for a couple of years. Mm. And I moved to Colorado. I had to completely start over from scratch, but it was hard for me because I went from a place where I knew everyone. I'd lived in Washington for 30 years and all my relationships were in the beverage industry, Washington, Oregon, and California. Yeah. And there's a lot of breweries in Colorado, but every one of them has a blood relative that designs their cans. Yeah, exactly. People here are hyper loyal <laughs> to the localness. Yes. Just absolutely. like Seattle, Portland, San Diego. Yep. So it took me a while to get going here. And that was in addition to still just getting my shit together. I had to borrow money from my parents just to be able to drive to Colorado. Wow. And my mom had since gotten remarried and uh, moved down here. So I was coming to visit, but I'd never been to Colorado before. And I knew that I was just, I was going to live in my mom's basement for an indefinite amount of time because I got a credit card with a $200 limit. And I, I just got kicked out of chase with one that had a $70,000 limit. <laughs> and so I couldn't, 
I couldn't get a bank account. I had to live in cash like a gangster. I mean, people don't think about this. Bless us that we have Uncle Sam that allows you to just throw up your hands and say, oops, I screwed up. Yeah. And wipe your slate clean. Like the fact that bankruptcy exists is, is absolutely amazing. But I did everything wrong. In a divorce, the only thing that they can't access is your retirement accounts sure. most times. And in a bankruptcy, it's the same. But I had to pull money out of my say out of my investment accounts to to pay my bills for the six months that I was getting sued. Wow. And so I did everything wrong. I literally plowed myself down to zero. Wow. And so you can imagine the shame that I had with this sort of complex of performance where I just did not know what to do. And so I ended up restarting my marketing business. I hired a couple of people. Things mm -hmm. were going okay, but it just was not what I am good at. I am good at developing beverage products from farm to table and distributing stuff and closing big deals. Okay. And in a market where I don't know anybody, the distribution's entirely different. When I first moved here, we didn't have alcohol in grocery stores in Colorado. Right. And although we do now, it's nothing like it is in other states. Correct. So I didn't really know where I belonged. I freelanced online for a while. I was doing odds and ends, artwork and photography solo. <laughs> but I went from having employees and partners and a ton of people in my sphere to being completely isolated for a couple of years. And wow. then I was so vulnerable. A couple of really toxic relationships came along and I just got beaten to a pulp. Wow. So that sounds like uh, self-inflicted scorched earth. So much. Okay. And I was really just feeling sorry for myself this whole way. I mean, count my blessings, but I, went on a path of therapy and, and um, explored different kinds of spirituality and physical fitness and just really trying to start from nothing because I was 30 and I was living with my mom for a while and her new husband and just trying to figure out how I was going to relaunch into the world. Okay. But one of the things that really affected me a lot was you know, when you get to that age, I don't know when you had kids, but when you get to that age where this is how old my parents were when they had me mm -hmm. and people are starting to have kids much later now. Sure. But uh, for example, I'm 34. And when my mom was 34, she had just had her second kid mm -hmm. and her, she had a kid at 30, me, and she had a kid at 34, but her mom passed away when she was 31 and her dad passed away when she was 35 mm -hmm. and her sister passed away when she was 40. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, gosh, if I had a kid right now, what would I be do? I mean, I know I would rise to the occasion, not right now, but five years ago. Sure. Uh, but it, it was startling. And if I lost one of my parents, what, what would I do? And it's, it's very difficult when you start seeing your parents as humans. And it's very difficult when you start seeing all the people that you grew up with change, they start having families, they start having other priorities. And the second business partner that I grew up with, um, he tried to mend the fence and it was just kind of a toxic relationship. I wasn't really mad at him for what he did. I would have done the same, but they, the other problem with that business is, you know, the guys that get kicked out of their company for some reason, but it still goes on to be awesome. Mm -hmm. So like Steve Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, or even someone that's there in the beginning, like Steve Wozniak and Apple, like yeah. you're there for the first couple of years, but you're always a legend because you helped start it. Right. And those guys spend a lot of money in lawyer fees to retain the recipes and the trademarks and stuff, but then they never did anything with it. Oh my goodness. And that was, that was seven years ago. And so this brand that I spent so much time building is now nothing. And it's the greatest culmination of everything in my career that I'm capable of everything that I did. And first of all, I feel bad for them for losing the money, but that business was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars with me. And it was worth zero without me. Because wow. none of the vendors or the distributors or our co-packers or any of the suppliers, none of them wanted to work with them. And it all just fell apart. But I had a business, I had another company that we worked with that had a couple hundred grand of our inventory 
that was already filled that they were on the hook for. And then they couldn't sell the stuff that they made for me because someone else now owned the license to it. They didn't want to work with them. It turned into this chaos. I haven't talked to any of the aforementioned people in five or six years. And I don't know what ended up happening because I moved to Colorado and didn't look back. Okay. So so I I have a question for you. You know, you went on this downhill spiral and, you know, rock bottom, you know, 30 year old living in his mom's basement. Right. I mean, you know, um, what was the pivot point that launched you back in the right direction? So I have never had any, uh, for, for working in the booze industry for so long, I have never had any substance abuse issues. Sure. Um, I don't do any drugs. I don't even really drink. And so it's my, uh, self-harm mechanism was always just the guilt. Okay. And the, I'm not good enough. What am I doing? Because when I quit my big fancy job where I always knew where I ranked, you know, we, I was part of a 50 person sales team that was part of a 400 person team in Washington. That was part of a 13,000 person team in the country. And I knew exactly where I ranked every single day and what I was worth to them. Yeah. And then when you're alone, it was still like, Oh, Andy's off you know, at a beer festival or he's down picking apples and grapes and making wine and he's cool. But people, people uh, admired me for being unique. Right. Just like in high school, when I was the one that was at music camp and they thought I was doing different than math class. Right. But uh, it all came to a head when I went to the hospital and when I started having to take depression medication, because anybody out there who's taken antidepressants or any kind of medication, I all of a sudden gained 30 pounds and I couldn't sleep and eating was difficult. And I, there are sex things. There's all the things, right. Yep. And it takes years to wean on and off of these meds and to switch and try different dosages and try different ones and combinations of multiple of them. It took me three years to, to figure out the meds that I needed to take. And there was a lot of side effects. Yeah. So the prospect of trying to date when I could have a freak out at a dinner table, uh, <laughs> all of that was pretty difficult. But I would say I, I camped out with my folks for a little while and I had been running an event business uh, still back in Seattle doing uh, beer festivals and wine tasting events. So I started traveling back and forth and did... Um, I stayed with a friend up there and she had just bought a house. And so I would be up there for two months and here for one month. And I would kind of be back and forth. So I was always on the move enough to not deal with dating relationships or uh, financial burdens, but, or the guilt of living with, with the folks for a little bit. But the, the bigger idea was uh, it, it all became, slowly momentum building because there was revenues coming into the coffers again. Sure. And I was in front of people. I was producing big events. I had thousands of people coming to my shows. So that was the upswing. And as I mentioned, there was a couple uh, more rock bottoms and I dated a couple of really crazy girls and made some pretty big mistakes. So it took a little doing, yeah. but I, landed a couple of clients down here. And I think it was really when I hired my first employee in Colorado. Okay. Uh, Just that feeling of, I've always had really codependent relationships and I've been a really big giver. Mm -hmm. And at one point I was dating someone for about six months and things just didn't work out and cool, cool. And I moved back to Washington and I was like, I'm going to do these shows. I'm going to see it through. I kind of got chased out with my tail between my legs last time. And I don't talk about my divorce very much because it was amicable and I am really happy for my ex-wife. But I went back and uh, about a month later, the girl that I'd been dating down here called me and said, I just got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. And she already had a new boyfriend (laughs) And, uh, was seeing someone, but she and her ex-husband had a, she had a daughter. I had never dated someone with a kid before. Right. And (laughs) she and her, uh, ex-husband had a deal in their parenting agreement that 
new significant others couldn't meet their daughter within six months. Yeah. So she had this new boyfriend, but he couldn't be around her kid. Yeah. And it, for some reason, I got up the next day. I packed up my crap. I drove back to Colorado. I moved in with her and I was a full-time nanny for about six months. Oh my goodness. And I just, even the small business that I'd started growing back doing freelance work online, I just walked from everything. I had my partners in Seattle sell all my crap in the apartment that I just furnished. And I had this huge wake up taking care of a two-year-old every day. Wow. And I packed lunches and I drove to daycare and I drew pictures and played games. And I was really reminded of what I'd worked with kids forever, but I'd never been responsible for one. Mm -hmm. And I got to help this little girl in formative years. And mom was literally sleeping in through the wall with her boyfriend and I was sleeping on the couch and uh, a lot of drama ensued because there's a lot of feelings ab- around being ill and being around people's kids and um, the adults did their thing. And uh, I started trying to date again and going home to my ex-girlfriend's house where I was a caregiver to her child didn't go over super great on the swiping apps. No. Nope. So Anyway, that was kind of, but I wasn't there for them. I was there for this kid. Right. And mom ended up recovering. She was great. Uh, But eventually I was carrying mom up the stairs and helping mom shower and um, trying to move them out of one apartment and into another. And this is another topic that I don't go into a ton because it's obviously very personal for the people that were involved. Sure. But I had never stopped working a theme that happened to me throughout the twenties was I monetized all my hobbies. Yeah. And this goes back to the good at everything, great at nothing thing. I got paid to ride bikes because I owned a team and we had sponsors. I got paid mm-hmm. to ski. I made snowboards for a little while. I got paid right. to do photography. I got paid to draw. I'm an artist. So you're kind of never working and you love what you're doing, all, all that, but you're kind of always working too. And everyone had access to me 24 seven. And I never said no to anything. And I took on stuff that I shouldn't have because I wanted to help people. And it, uh, I had to stop everything to put this little girl ahead of that. So that was the turning point for me. Okay. Then I started my agency again. I started networking. I invested in a barber shop. Uh, I was around people again. And I started hiring folks and I started running my agency again here. And that went well for uh, a year or two. And then the, you know, pandemic progressed into what I do now. Okay. So uh, what a journey. Uh, (laughs) I don't really tell the whole story very much. And I hope people are still listening. No, no, no. It's important because, you know, the thing is, a lot of people just don't understand. They think that people have these perfect lives. And, you know, if you're successful X, Y, Z, well, success doesn't happen overnight. And I'm a very good friend uh, over there in Golden. He was the founder of EAS. And everybody thought that, that he was just this overnight success. Well, no, it was more than a decade to get to a point where he sold his company, made some money, and uh, Bill Phillips. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's important to understand that because you went through an incredible journey, but you pivoted and you you parlayed those struggles and all of those into something new. So let's talk for a minute now, well, for more than a minute, about what you're doing today with the podcast network. Sure. So help, help me un- help our listeners understand, for those out there not familiar, what are podcast networks and what made you decide to get one going? So in the past couple of years, starting in 2019, there were some very large acquisitions of podcasting companies. Podcasting as a medium has gotten very popular. Mm -hmm. Obviously, YouTube has been around for a while. It's got the staying power. It'll continue being the future. Blogs have come back and forth. Yep. But as you know, from your background, a lot of people are trying to figure out what to do. And transitioning from radio, transitioning from TV, people that uh, worked at a newspaper before, Now, am I supposed to be publishing on my own or do I get aligned with something? Do I write a book? But a lot of people in the media industry are very confused about what to do. And you used to have people would come out of broadcasting school and they would get a small market gig in a Missoula, Montana, and then maybe they would get to move to a a Portland, Oregon, and then eventually a Seattle or a Denver. Mm 
Yep. But that could take 30 years. Exactly. And you had people at the anchor desk that were in their 50s, 60s, 70s. And it was impossible to get into the business because there was such a high barrier of entry. Yeah. Now you've got 25-year-olds at the anchor desk that cost a quarter as much. Yeah. And they don't have that journeyman uh, pay status. And they are qualified. But that would have never happened before. So now yeah. it's, it's super cutthroat. Yep. And there's no advantage in experience other than connections. So people started, it's like the AM radio days, you know? Yeah. And people wanted to start sharing their stories, telling podcasts. So the movement caught the eye of the likes of Amazon, Spotify, Sirius XM, Pandora, yep. um, which Sirius, Sirius and XM merged together yep. and they bought Pandora. And they bought but Pandora. there are several companies people might not recognize, but there's one called The Ringer. Um, a broadcaster from ESPN named Bill Simmons broke yep. away and uh, took a couple people and started a company called The Ringer. And they got bought by Spotify for mm -hmm. just under 200 million. And they had 40 employees and 40 podcasts, yeah. which is pretty amazing, including administrative staff. So there's one called Parcast that's from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And a guy, I believe he graduated from Stanford and he and his dad started doing the true crime and scripted drama stuff after yeah. the series serial became really popular. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about people huddled around their radio, listening to mystery stories. I mean, yeah. This is like the 1950s, you know, exactly. but it's super caught on and people love the, the true crime uh, America's most wanted kind of stuff. Sure. And so they made an entire portfolio of that stuff and they eventually started doing scripted dramas and original content. Yeah. So they also got purchased by Spotify and it was just one after another. There's one called Gimlet Media from New York that does mostly business stuff mm -hmm. and they got bought by Spotify. Spotify and, is spending some serious cash. I mean, look how much they dumped on just Joe Rogan on his own, you know, a hundred yep. million dollars on Joe yep. Rogan. I mean, the crazy. Obamas, Kim Kardashian. Yeah. So most recently there's been this switch to people being exclusively available. So they're acquiring podcasts and having them pull off of Apple and all the other networks. Right. And you can only get them on Spotify. Yeah. So they've done three or four of those in the last couple of months. Anyhow, there's about eight companies that are in this huge status. They got right. into podcasting early. The biggest one is Barstool Sports, mm -hmm. but they've been known for years doing things for college students, selling t-shirts, doing you know all different kinds of media. They're really big in TikTok and Snapchat yep. and a lot more yep. progressive. But uh, Wondery is a big one. There's NPR affiliates. There's a couple studios that do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's this Herculean gap to the next ones. Yeah. Like it goes from 150 million valuation to less than 1 million. Right. And the reason people don't want to start a podcasting <clears throat> network is because it takes a long time to cultivate an audience, whether you're into YouTube or even in Instagram. It can take a year or two to get a significant following. Right. Uh, and depending on what your goals are, there's several different kinds of podcasters, but depending on what your goals are, it can take a long time to bear fruit in any kind, not even just financially. So the prospect of starting 20 or 25 shows from scratch is very risky. Yeah. So there I was running my marketing business in Denver and a pandemic rolled around. Yeah. And all of a sudden we were taken on anything just to be able to pay my employees. Sure. And instead of working with breweries and wineries and kombucha companies, I'm doing a website for a dentist that you're never going to know about. Right. Or we're doing these, our big retainers became small subscriptions and yeah. people are paying us a couple hundred bucks to do their social media content. And it's just soul sucking because we go from having five big clients to having 35 small clients. Right. And if any of them have drama, you just feel like you have to bend over backwards every single day. So I had a podcast that I started just to be able to meet people in yeah. the Rockies called Colorado Preneurs. And I interview Colorado business people and I really just did it to, to meet some folks. Mm -hmm. I'm not a traditional networking guy. I don't really just pop up to events and hand out cards. And it was great to get to tell people stories. So one of my employees said, Hey, uh, I'd really like to start producing the show about six months in we uh, had recorded about 50 episodes. And she said, Hey, could I start doing the booking for you and become the producer of this show? I'll do the editing. I'd really like to learn. So uh, I said, that's great, but our podcast 
doesn't exactly make money. It's kind of a fun thing and it's good for exposure. Yeah. And so I told her if we bring on other podcasts to do contract production, then we can do this. And we brought on a couple and it went really well. So about a month later, I decided to launch a media network and see what happened. And in the early days, we tried to do some kind of algorithm hacking. So we brought on this guy that's a golf pro down in Florida. And instead of being the number 300 golf podcast, he specialized in golf betting. And since DraftKings and all this stuff has been legalized in 28 states in the last year, uh, he would still talk about last week's tournament, next week's tournament, but then there'd be about five minutes of the betting spreads. Mm -hmm. But instead of being number 300 golf podcast, we were like number three golf betting podcast. Wow. And we had a guy that did a basketball podcast about sneakers, but that was our kind of shoehorn, as I call it. We got in because he talked about celebrities and fashion and endorsement deals and He was still just another basketball podcast. He talked mostly about the basketball happenings, but we had a lot of those and we posted for podcast hosts and we had about 14,000 applications uh, in three months from all over the country. And I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are out of work. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people that were formerly a radio host and their show just decided to wrap because of the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. or um, people that were not able to, I had a lot of uh, academics. I had one gal that was uh, a drama teacher at NYU film school, and she wanted to do a podcast with an eight person voice acting cast. And they wanted to audibly act out uh, screenplays from up and coming playwrights. But the the technology behind that was going to be a big undertaking. I had a guy here in Colorado that wanted to come to our studio twice a month and set up a five person band and live stream video on what the songwriting process is. Wow. So all these weird things. I have one right now with a guy that is a longtime video game writer and he is studying to be a Cicerone. He just passed the Cicerone exam being a beer expert. Right. And he actually does pairing between beer and video games. <laughs> and so he'll say like, this is a dark beer. This is a dark game, but they all have these really fun nuances of like, this is the brewery where I met my wife and this was my favorite game through childhood that gives me the warm feels. And as it turns out, like now he's got people that are buying those beers and live streaming on Twitch and they all drink the beer together and play the game together. Like you would never (laughs) predict this stuff. No, I I wouldn't dream. I I think you lie to you if you thought that we're making it up. So So we started a, uh, we started an incubator program and a scholarship for college students. And we just kind of tested out some very um, niche topics just to really cut our teeth into things that weren't being done before, but also make our portfolio very unique. So then when people go to it, they see a very broad swath of what's out there. Because if we just tried to do three dudes talking about football, we're not going to compete. Yeah. There's plenty of those out there. And starting with, uh, no cash. One of the things that I'm proud of in my career, I've started over 20 businesses uh, for myself and for clients, mm-hmm. and none of them have ever started with capital fundraising. It's all been privately financed. And we started this media company with zero dollars and okay. no guarantees. So we have a handful of shows that we produce that people pay us to produce. And a mm-hmm. lot of them aren't publicly promoted as ours. So We have a public facing network um, that has about 18 shows right now. Mm -hmm. And then we have another 10 or 12 that we produce. Some of them we do in a partnership. Some of them we just, they pay us to record and edit. Right. And then one of the things that we set out to accomplish to stand apart is knowing that none of our hosts came in with millions of followers in social media. Right. A lot of them either have great pipes and they're a good broadcaster or They have very unique and engaging content and access to good guests and diverse uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. But I come from a product development background. Right. So usually you start a podcast, you hope it grows. You eventually maybe foster a good following. You garner some advertising revenue. But four or five years later, you're trying to do some kind of online course. You're trying to sell some kind of products. Well, we went in the opposite direction. We chose a lot of people that were the coach type, 
we're a lifestyle network. We don't do politics, sports, or religion, yep. but we have a lot of like the yogis, life coaches, art people, yeah. you know, climbing, cycling, outdoor activities, whenever we have a gal that lives in a van and does the van life thing. <laughs> a lot of people like that stuff. Oh, we yeah. do yeah. movies. And so rather than doing your straight up pop culture or current events, we have a lot of more educational stuff. Fantastic. And so we set out though, to find people that were self-employed, and we could do not only can I make merch with your logo on it of your podcast, but have you ever wanted to own your own line of yoga pants? Uh, I'll make it for you. Yeah. And so we have a couple people that are actually patenting products and we are publishing. We started a small publishing arm. We're publishing eight like actual paper printed books by the end of the year. Wow. And we've got some ambitions uh, working with uh, Barnes and Noble and some independent bookstores. But we have multiple people writing books. We're launching journals and uh, motivational products. We're helping people develop online courses. So we really set out to be a more uh, full circle commerce ready product from the beginning because we know how long it's going to take to get to advertising revenue. Exactly. Revenue. Meanwhile, over 1 million podcasts have been started in the past 12 months. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there are now over 2 million total podcasts. And in 2018, there was 500,000. Yeah. And since the beginning of 2020, there have been over a million started. So there may be a saturation point. Podcasts might stop being cool. So we have Daydreamer Network is our public facing network that we own. We license a couple shows with existing podcasts. We help some people start some in in a partnership agreement. And then we have the ones that we actually finance. But you can imagine, it's not like owning SportsCenter and Dan Patrick leaves and you just throw in Scott Van Pelt. I'm not paying these guys a salary to sit behind the desk. Like They own their intellectual property. Yeah. So every one of the podcasts that we have that has a host is is making a show that they're eventually going to own. Yeah. And this very famously just happened with Barstool Sports with a show called Call Her Daddy. The, The host, Alex Cooper was in a million dollar contract with Barstool, but they told her at the end of her three-year contract that she would own the IP. And she just signed a $60 million contract with Spotify. And they said, you live out this thing. You let us sell a shitload of merch for you. But when you get to a company that's that size, all the shows on Barstool have private label vodkas. They have a ton of merch. They have events. And I'm capable of creating all that stuff. We just need a couple of years to get there. Yeah, that's but fantastic. that's what's different about us. So we are finally we're coming up on a year. We started last August officially, um, but we've really been test marketing for the first about six months. So I would say we started official business activities this spring, mm-hmm. and uh, we are just starting now our advertising and sponsorship programming, and we have got a pretty good foothold going after bigger uh, talent to come to them to the network. Mm -hmm. But we have the Daydreamer Network uh, portfolio. We have Daydreamer Studios, which is the non-public side of of the production company. Mm -hmm. And then we have Daydreamer Marketing, um, which we just kind of threw in all the stuff that we were doing at my other agency. We do Mm -hmm. uh, social media management and some video and photography for content creators. Okay. And so it's really just all the marketing that we do for some of our podcast people and our clients. We might as well make that available to other people. Our whole mantra is empowering storytellers and making podcasting available to all. And then we have this publishing. What a journey, my friend. Uh, Gosh, Uh, you know, you've kind of come full circle in in many ways. When you, when you look at your exposure and your upbringing to all the sales and marketing and that stuff, your journey through the alcohol industry, uh, your rock bottom moments, and now you're back in media and communications and you're you reestablish yourself after a pretty big crash so it's definitely uh, not a charming metamorphosis i am not a pretty <laughs> butterfly i'm a tattered butterfly <laughs> but uh there was a couple rock bottoms and uh i can't say that i've uh made it you know i yeah. i'm a guy who will always be self-employed no matter if i have one penny or 50 million dollars or 50 billion dollars <laughs> but uh, I will always be self-employed. I will always employ people. Yeah. I have the honor of being able to create jobs and to teach people. And kind of the capstone is I'm currently working on a nonprofit project around mental health for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Yeah. 
So a lot of our most demanding occupations in the United States, doctors, lawyers, public officials, police, firefighters, there's a lot of research done around their mental health and yeah. there's a lot of resources made available for them. Veterans, let's not forget that uh, one. PFTD, uh, yeah. So, but the thing is with as many as half of Americans going to have some kind of side hustle up to self-employment, there's 34 million people that are classified as self-employed right now. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't count all the people that have side hustles, Etsy and Uber and multiple jobs and all these yeah. things. It, it's really hard because now more so than ever, people are choosing to forego traditional medical insurance. Yeah. And even if they are paying for it, they're not getting mental health. And so people can't afford to get therapy or any kind of help or like the emotional support animals. People have really been abusing that because they want to take their dog on an airplane. Yeah. But there are actual trained dogs that can sense if someone's going to have a panic attack or if people with epilepsy, people with PTSD, right. there are actual medical, they're called psychiatric animals, not emotional support, but it costs $30,000 to get one of those. Yeah. And there's a four-year waiting list. Right. So I'm working, testing out in Denver, a nonprofit that is going to create educational media, provide in-person workshops and events and then do a three-year research project with academics across the country to try and establish a database that we can take to municipal governments and financial institutions to try to provide some kind of a la carte service for small business owners. And this is kind of my uh, joy. I am a beverage industry dude forever. Yeah. And that is a hard transition for me. I'm sure you've experienced this and a lot mm -hmm. of other people have. I'm an expert at selling alcohol, you know, in the top 1% in the country, sure. but I'm not an expert at podcasting. This all just kind of happened. This kind of happened. And so you got to follow your intuition. But if I've learned one thing, it's everyone is affected by mental health. And I can't say that mine's any different than yours. I can't say mine's any worse than yours. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I can identify with everyone's because people that have been in, in, uh, combat situations and people that have had significant loss, people that have been in accidents, it, everybody has a different experience, but we all are affected by mental health. Yep. So I really want to continue serving uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs, both through doing coaching and a lot of teaching, but also trying to make a long-term future that is going to have mental health resources to help these people because it. In our culture, we really idealize the Silicon Valley startup founder, and we call them entrepreneurs. Yeah, I did an episode on one of my shows this week about what is an entrepreneur. Yeah, and because we don't think about the guy that owns the Ben and Jerry's franchise as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but he assumed financial risk, he established yeah. a business, and he does it every day by himself. And that's no different than Jeff Bezos starting Amazon in a garage. That's right. So. But we really think it's great when people stay up all night and don't have a social life and build computer apps. Yeah. But it's not always like that. And you don't realize that years can go by and those people struggle with relationships and reality of their circumstances. Well, fantastic. You have been on an amazing journey. Um, I'm going to have you back because uh, I know there's more to unpack here, <laughs> but uh, I think we'll get to, to come to a closure for today, but I've got a, one last question for you that I ask all of my guests. Now, we have a um, concept here in Western culture called a bucket list, okay? And I've actually interviewed the bucket list guy down in uh, Melbourne, uh, a guy named Trav Bell, amazing guy, great story about purposeful lives. But there's always an opposite of everything in the universe. Now, that opposite is a list of things that you don't have any interest in, don't ever want to do, okay? That list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, okay? <laughs> and this is a family show, so a little bit, so we try to avoid that. But so we want to know what, because you've been very transparent today. I mean, you've, sure. you've opened up the kimono in many, many ways to, you know, share your story because it, like you said, it's, it's not a perfect story, you know, and you've, you've run into some serious walls, some self-inflicted, I think, in fact, most of them, but anyway, yep. um, I want to ask you what might be an item or two that's on your effort list. Now I'll give you some examples of things uh, for mine. Okay. One, I'm not going to have a collection of pet snakes and that never going to ever happen. 
Okay, I'm not a snake guy. Uh, two, I'm not big on sardines and caviar. That just, that whole concept, open up a can, have something looking at you, no thank you. Um, and then this one I actually did here in Colorado, and I could direct you to if anybody's ever interested. I will never, ever again do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge. The concept of excessive heat, Ooh. excessive humidity, excessive drumming, and chanting with a slice of nudity. Nope, not going <laughs> to not going to do that. So what might be an item or two as we wrap up here today, Andy, that would be on your effort list? Now, I know you've been through some things. So what might be on your effort list? Uh, I'm one of these people that has a really adverse reaction to cilantro. Okay. Like it tastes like plastic to me. Yep, exactly. I'm with you. And I, oddly enough, a couple of years ago, I got a stomach virus in Bosnia. Mm. And I'm not going to describe what happened in the plane on the way home, but I lost Ugh. 12 pounds. Uh, but since then, I my stomach's just been annihilated and I've done some stuff for it, but I react pretty poorly to uh, sp spicy foods. And so yeah. things like street tacos that always have cilantro, uh, those make me sick. I don't have a huge desire to... Um, I can find myself spiritually without doing any psychedelic drugs. Yep. A lot of people in Colorado like to head down to New Mexico or Southern Utah and have these desert experiences. I'm kind of a polar bear. Okay. I think Canada is amazing. Like say what you will about politics, but this is one of the largest countries in the world and fewer people live there than the state of Texas. Yeah. And Incredible. you're seeing these massive heat waves. Like if people start rushing North, I'll be the first one or the furthest north because I love the winter. Yeah. And one of the problems with Colorado is the weather's so extreme here. So it'll snow at the end of May, but then one day it'll be zero degrees and the next day it'll be 80 degrees. Yeah. So you don't get where I grew up. It snows in November and it stays there through April. Right. And it's a white Christmas every year. Yeah. And I was listening to one of your episodes uh, from a few weeks ago with a gal that was in Australia and she was talking about how it's their winter. Yeah. And I've been to Australia in the summertime. And there's obviously not snow, but uh, the snakes go away, which is great. Yeah. And I align with you on that one because seven of the 10 deadliest snake varieties in the world live in Australia. <laughs> and while I was there last time, they were all asleep. That's great. So I, uh, I also do not want to ever live again with uh, fear or doubt and you define your own success and it's, up to you, not other people to tell you what success is. I've had a lot of people that indirectly told me that I needed to care about how much money I made. And yeah. I do not, I don't care if I live under a freeway, as long as I get to help people. Fantastic. That's Fantastic. paramount for me. Well, you've been an awesome guest today and thank you for being so transparent on the front side. And even at the end, you know, it's nice to know that there's someone out there who doesn't like cilantro just as much as me. So <laughs> I appreciate that. And you, if you shared a lot of vulnerabilities, but you've also shared ups and downs and how people do that. And again, that's so important to listeners who are out there. So if you hear Andy's story, you know, people can overcome just about anything. It's, it's really true what people decide to do. So appreciate you coming on. So folks, we're gonna call this a wrap for today's episode. We will get Andy back on. There's a lot more to unpack. So please, as a parting thing, stop by the show website, rexandrewshow.com. You have an inner um, a profile there for Andy and all of our guests. Uh, we have about 65 people lined up to come on the show. So a lot of people to come. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. And we'll say the thing that we say every single time. Be safe, but be bold and make it a great day. <laughs>